Taylor Decker's on my all 22 fantasy team, by the way. Stop. Stop it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Taylor. I don't care, and I'm in the league. I'm just trying to hype up the future of fantasy football yeah. here. They told me we could hype it up. Nobody cares about your fantasy team. That's one of the uh, cardinal my rules way. of broadcasting. Regardless of the medium, they don't care. So the strategic component to this game is through the roof. Go, go, your go, predictions, go. right? Your forecasting in fantasy football into how good is this player? This is gonna it's gonna change the industry. Yeah. yeah. I moved to the old town where it goes down. Look at me now. I wrote my goals down. I hold it down. Made myself proud. Say look at me now. Hello and welcome to the All22 Podcast. I'm Chris Lombardi and I'm joined by Bobby Acker and Ray Cotto and we are the co-founders of All22. Guys, welcome. What's going on? It's like it's like Christmas week, you know? I gotta be honest, like I get more excited for this than I do get for Christmas. Yeah, I wake this, this is way more fun. This is way more fun. And uh shout out to the uh to the sickness, cold virus thing, whatever it was that you know made sure to infect me the week before the draft. So I'm back up to full speed. Come draft night, you know, much love. Appreciate that. Ray, why'd you, what happened? Why don't you tell our, our, our well, listeners what yeah, happened? Well, if, if, you, if you're a loyal listener, right, you listened to last week's episode, I squatted heavy. So naturally, you know, I got sick. But it's all right. I'm getting better. That, 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 that's all good. You just come back stronger, you know? I timed it just right. The definition of madness, right? It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Yeah, keep squatting heavy, right? <laughs> I think the definition of madness is just leg day. I think that's what it is in the dictionary, actually, but it's fine. Cool. Guys, it's draft week. Like, couldn't be more excited. Just absolutely couldn't. Like Bobby said, I feel like I'm waking up every morning, and there's just, like, birds singing outside my window. Like, that's what I'm in, a, like, a fairy tale this week. That's because your team drafts well. <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what we're here to talk about, right? And uh, I think every, I think everyone we're going to talk about this episode is here because they don't draft well. Exactly. So, so to Ray, to your point, today we are going to be talking about uh, what we think NFL teams will do with the top 10 picks, and then we're going to talk about what we would do with the top 10 picks, uh, and then we're going to throw in some fun little uh, predictions afterwards. But guys, let's start off with what we think teams will actually do, starting off with pick number one, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Ray, you are on the clock. Man. So here, here's what I think will happen, right? What I think. Not, 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 not what I would do. And it, it's crazy because it's so far off from what I would do that I almost don't think it could happen. But with Vegas now being on board... I, I have to believe it's going to happen. So with the first pick, the Jaguars, I think, are going to take Trevon Walker. No. It, it, Vegas is saying it. I, I can't, who am I to I go know. against Vegas? No, it's not you. It's Vegas. I get it. Exactly. <laughs> Just, I still hate hearing it. It's two weeks after that podcast where we talked about this, and I still hate it. <laughs> Bobby, do you have a different opinion of what you think the Jags are going to do? Yeah. So, like – you guys know me. I'm the conspiracy theorist of the group. And uh, I just feel like all that Trevon Walker stuff was just draft hype stories put out by the marketing department at the NFL. Um, so I have them going with Aiden Hutchinson, as we expected all along. So I'm going to agree with you there. My take was Aiden Hutchinson as well. I think he's just the elite talent of the draft, maybe the only elite talent of the draft. Yeah. And I don't see them passing on him there. Trent, Trent Ball can't get this wrong. He's gotten too many things wrong in the past. There's a no-brainer guy there at one. You take the no-brainer. I had a question to ask the group of something that you think could – I wanted to see if you think it could possibly happen. Do you think there's any chance Detroit tries to trade up to one? For what purpose? To get Hutchinson, to make sure they land Hutchinson. I don't think so, No. It's interesting yeah. to me because they have the 32nd pick, the Lions, and the Jags have the 33rd. So maybe there's some, like, easy flips they do, and then maybe they throw in, like, a third-round pick or something like that just to move up one spot to get him. I was just curious if you thought it was a possibility at all. I think at this point the Jags have to be in love with somebody, right? 
And I feel like if you're going to trade back from one to two, you're risking the guy you fell in love with who you're not making public. Clearly, that's why there's all this uncertainty. You're risking not getting that guy if you're, if you're moving off the spot. I don't think you want to do that. Like I said, if you're the GM of the Jags, can't get this wrong. Don't, don't mess with it. Yeah, you will, you will be destroyed for being too cute if you're the Jags. And the guy you take at two is either not as good as the guy that the Lions would then take at one or just in general not good. Um, yeah, you're, you're putting a big bullseye on your back to make a move like that. And, and then for the Lions, it's like, no, nah, they're the Jaguars. Let, let them screw it up, and then you just take who's left and, and go from there. There's Ray, there, there's Ray, there's Chris Stir in the pot again. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the Please. thing, right? There is, there's one elite edge or so we think, but there's three tackles. The Lions don't need a tackle. They're like maybe the one team in the top five that does not need a tackle. They need an edge. It, it kind of makes sense for both sides, right? The Jacks trade back. They can get a tackle. The Lions can get the edge and it works out for both sides. I'm just saying like, maybe there's a pipe dream that that could happen. If it happens, we'll clip this. We'll put it on TikTok. We'll timestamp it. Cool, cool, cool. cool. You'll have proof. <laughs> All right, moving on to pick number two. Ray, uh, no, Bobby, you're going to start off with pick number two. You're the yes. Detroit Lions on the clock. Pick number two for the Lions. I have Sauce Gardner. Um, like you said, Chris, they're the only team in the top five that are that are good on tackle. Right? They can skip that position group. Whatever. They've been trying to get this corner position right for a while. I, if you have confidence in Jeffrey Okuda, you're probably the only person that does. And I feel bad for him, and I hope I'm wrong. But at this point, you can't put all your eggs in that basket. You know, his rookie season wasn't that good, got hurt. His sophomore season wasn't looking so good, got hurt again. I think if you're, if you're really trying to get that corner, go get him. He's right there for you. Don't mess around. Um, I know edge rusher is also a need, but if you're the Lions, I think you can address that at the top end of the second and uh, and still get a pretty pretty solid edge rusher. Well, in my world, the Jags just took Trevon Walker, so the Lions take you know the full the full allotment of time there. They run the clock all the way down for no apparent reason, just to make everyone wait, and then they take Hutchinson anyway, like everyone would anticipate at that point in time anyway. So. I've got the Lions taking Hutch, pretty self-explanatory. They have that edge need, you know, Michigan guy. It just makes all the sense in the world. So I had a slightly different take than Bobby's, but kind of along the same lines. Like I think the Lions are going to think about things differently than everybody else. And I think they have a different way of doing things. And, you know, watching Dan, Dan Campbell press conferences, he seems like a mean SOB. And I think he's going to want to just make the meanest possible team I do think Trayvon Walker has some of that in him when you watch his tape. And no, he's not Aiden Hutchinson, but I think that some of the rumors we might be hearing about Walker rising up draft boards could be because Detroit ends up taking him at two. So that's where I'm going to land. There, there's Potsdura, Chris, again. I don't, I don't, dude, Hutchinson <laughs> is mean. Hutchinson is mean. You didn't see him like point at that guy before he just like leveled him. He's not there like, anymore. He's off the board at one for me. It's funny right, too. Yeah, you're right. That's your world. That's your world. Makes sense. That's right. It's funny too. We talked about this before the podcast. I'm trying to do my mock draft of the f whole first round. And if Trayvon Walker doesn't go number one overall, I have a hard time putting him anywhere in the top 10. Like you'll, you'll see my mock. He's not even, he's not even there. It Oof. becomes it, this, this year. It's, it's really difficult. It really is. Easily the hardest year of mock drafting I've ever had to do. Cause I think most years, right. You have, you're talking about which quarterback's going to end up going one and then which quarterback's going to end up going two. And then does another one end up go going in the top five, but there was really none of that. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. Tough. Ray, you were on the board at number three, Houston Texans. Who are you taking? Who are they taking? All right. So in my, uh, my world here in the, uh, in the metaverse, Walker's gone to Jacksonville. Hutch has gone to Detroit. Houston's on the clock, and they really need just about everything. And I actually have them. It's the first curveball. I've got them going steadily at, at corner. I think they think, you know, 
he's I think they look at that LSU freshman tape and go, that's the best tape of any corner since Jalen Ramsey. We're going to swing for the fences because we need to hit a bunch of home runs and we're going to go Stingley. So I've got Stingley to the Texans at three. What I think, what I think would happen. That's my first curveball, what I think. You have two huge risks in the top three. <laughs> it's just swing interesting. It's just interesting. That's all. Yeah. Again, I, I'm not the GM of these guys. I'm just, I'm just going through, but I'm, you know, I'm but going a different, I'm going a different way. Because I feel like if you're in those top five picks, you're there for a reason. And you really, you've really you been taking chances that haven't been paying off. So my pick for Houston at three is Evan Neal. You go safe. You protect Davis Mills. Get the best look at him you possibly can this year. If he's not the guy, you have your franchise tackle. Moving into next year for whoever comes in next. I'm going Evan Neal if I'm, if I'm Houston. Uh, I think the Houston Texans go Evan Neal. Yeah, I had Evan Neal as well. So I think the Texans told us that they value offensive line tremendously when they traded for Laramie Tunzel a few years ago. They've kind of balked at every other position on like, you know, defensive backs, receivers, getting rid of like Hopkins. So I don't think they value those positions as much. And I think they believe in building through the trenches. I think they would have gone edge in my draft if Hutchinson or Walker was there. But since they were not, I think they go Neil. They move Neil to right. They keep Tunzel at left, and they try to build an offensive line for Davis Mills. Makes okay. sense. All right, um, Ray. I just had you go first, right? So, Bobby, you want to take the Jets? What are yeah. they going to end up doing? Typical Jets move, right here, right? Every year we see somebody fall to the Jets who shouldn't fall to the Jets. <laughs> So I have Kayvon Thibodeau going to the Jets at, at four overall. Um, I really like Kayvon there. I think uh, Robert Sala is going to love him there. Another, um, you know, a, a piece to kind of build that culture in New York too. So I really like Kayvon for the Jets at four if he's there. I have the same thing. I have the Jets taking Kayvon at four. So that's what I think will happen. Yeah, I hate that I'm all three of us there. agree. I think that it happens too, and it's for the exact same reason. Jets things just fall into the Jets' lap. Yeah, and unfortunately, yep. it doesn't always work out for those players <laughs> because they are talented players. So it must be something about the water in New York. Thursday night, after we watch the draft together, we're going to part ways, and before we part ways, we're going to say to each other, "Man, really like the Jets what they did tonight," because <laughs> we say it every night on draft night. Man, really like what the what the Jets did in the draft. And then every single year, like mm -hmm. clockwork. All right. So something a little maybe, more interesting. Maybe, but let's go. <laughs> something a little more interesting, Ray. Let's jump into what the giant, what you think the giants do at five. Oh, Ray gets to go first for this one. I think I should go first twice. <laughs> no, I purposely did that. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're the even numbers here. Right. So stir anyway. the pot. <laughs> let the cowboy fan pick for the giants. Great. The, the giants, all the guys that, that they could have taken that would have just, you know, been bad picks for them are now off the board. So they make the easy choice here in Ikeem Aquanu, pet cat, great value here. It's exactly what they need. It's their biggest need. I think they take Aquanu at five. Yeah. I'm, I'm also taking Ray's pet cat here. It makes the most sense. If he's there, you don't mess around with pick number five. If there's a guy that you love, that's there to bookend Andrew Thomas play the other side. I think Icky's, the perfect fit right there comes in, starts day one. It's a no brainer. I think you run the card up if he's still there at five. I hope the next few picks, we all disagree because it's getting a little boring because that's my pick as well. And uh, you know, the new GM, the new coach, I think one of the first statements they said when they arrived was I'm going to fix the offensive line. If they don't do that with pick number five, I think they're doing a disservice to the fans. And I think it starts to build that conspiracy where giants fans are saying we're being fed, you know, false promises, right? So I think you're exactly right, Bobby. If they're on the clock and Aquanu's there, they run the card up. Just be careful because Dave Gettleman also said he was going to fix the offensive line. That was like the first thing he said in his introductory press conference was he was talking about hog mollies. And those hog mollies never came. <laughs> well, Gettleman's gone, so you, you can rejoice. No, I don't trust anybody until it's earned. So Ooh. Icky comes through. I'm a happy guy. Cool. So now this might be the first controversial pick, or at least I'm hoping it will be. 
Uh, Bobby, you were on the clock as the Carolina Panthers. What, what are they doing? Yeah, the Carolina Panthers are tough because Ben McAdoo just put his foot in his mouth after saying that Sam Donald was the starting quarterback. However, that doesn't mean that you don't draft a quarterback and Sam Donald's still your starter because a lot of these quarterbacks coming in are developmental guys, right? They're not – that's kind of been the consistent theme with this quarterback class is they're not all day one starters or none of them are day one starters. Um, but I think they go Kenny Pickett anyway, even though – uh, McAdoo said that. I think the ties between Matt Rule and Kenny Pickett at Temple, I think that's what gets it done. I think they like having an athletic quarterback at somebody that would fit with what Matt Rule is trying to do there. Um, I'm going Kenny Pickett for Carolina at six. Oh, they might do something really stupid, right? They, but look, they, they passed on much better quarterbacks last year in the top 10. Now there's much, much worse quarterbacks on the board here as far as prospects are concerned. And they're starting to, what, left tackle right now is who, Cam Irving? Like, are, are you kidding me? Like, no, take Evan Neal. He's still on the board in my metaverse. You're going to take Neal, keep solidifying that offensive line, and go from there. So take Neal. Do, do not reach for a quarterback at this point and, uh, and go from there. So I think given that they passed on a better quarterback last year, they'll do it again this year and just uh, keep working on that offensive line. I think it's just because you have Sam Darnold shares. This is what I think will happen. All right. I'm not the GM yet. That's, that's the next segment. All right. This is gotcha. also the same team that hired Ben McAdoo. <laughs> so I don't know. They could do some weird things. And like you said, they just skipped on a really good quarterback class last year. So I was going to play know. devil's advocate on that. So we're saying that it was a great quarterback class because that's what we were told. Right. But this, we saw their freshman seasons and none of them really blew us away. I mean, Mac Jones was pretty good and he was the last one taken. Was there a chance that that was just an overhyped draft class? And saying that, it's like, is this draft class maybe being undervalued? And is there maybe somebody there that somebody could fall in love with, like a Kenny Pickett, who is my pick at six for the Carolina Panthers? Could that could that be the reality too? It's a small sample size, right? I mean, all those guys other than Mac Jones and Trey Lance went to pretty bad situations to start off. So I think it's tough to judge them at this point. Trey Lance didn't even get get really that that many looks in uh in San Fran. Mac Jones, I mean, come on, it's it's it's, it's the Patriots, you know, they're not going to they're not going to put him in a situation to fail. So it's too soon. The jury's still out. Yeah, it's it's definitely too soon. Um the tape is the tape and it's still much better than any of these guys in this class at all. I think the only one that has the potential to make someone fall in love with them is Willis. Um, but that's it, right? And Willis would have been clearly after, at least in my book, Fields or Mac Jones in last year's class. So, Okay. All right, let's jump to pick number seven. Bobby, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. You get to choose. Oh, my gosh. You're so soft. Why are you going soft on me, Chris? Are you kidding You me? get to choose first who the Giants would take at seven. What, what do they do? So the Giants take nobody at seven. The Giants trade out of pick number seven. What are you what are you rubbing your eyes for, Ray? No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> the Giants trade out of pick number seven. They get a ton of value from Pittsburgh who needs to come up and get Malik Willis. At this point, it works out for the Giants because they have a lot of needs. They can move back and address those needs. Also, it works out because the Giants don't have a great cap situation to pay two top ten picks. I don't think it's very likely that the Giants stay in the top 10 with both of those picks. If they're going to move one of those, I think they move seven. And they move it to the Steelers. Steelers come up and get the quarterback that, I mean, it's well documented that Mike Tomlin kind of loves Malik Willis. So that's what they do there. The Giants are going to be boring. They're going to sit here, and they're going to make the same mistake that the Crosstown Jets do. Uh, at the top end of drafts when they build their team, which is half-bake either side of the ball when you really need to lean into one or the other. 
So they're going to sit here and boringly take Sauce Gardner at seven overall and go, ah, oh, well, we're, you know, Bradbury's making a ton of money and we need help in the secondary. And they're going to sit there, stand pat, and take Sauce. I have them staying, taking Sauce, because they want to see the headline in the paper. Like the Daily News is going to say, uh, uh, what was it? Applesauce. Applesauce. Apple sauce. Yeah. It's going to say Applesauce. <laughs> they, had, they had Eli Apple. They had like the other half a while ago. They drafted another corner in the top 10 just to get a headline. And I agree with Ray. I think it's a horrible idea. They need to lean into that offensive line and fix it. But that's what they do. In, in my scenario, the Giants are trading back from 7 to 20, and they're getting either Zion or Linderbaum to address the offensive line. Or if, or if you know, they, they plan on moving Bradbury or have a, a, a deal for Bradbury during the draft, they get someone like Kyler Gordon or Roger McCreary back at 20. And that makes the most sense. The new era of Giants football, Ray. It it, it can make sense, uh, but the the Giants are picking here because they do things that don't make sense. It's a new era of Giants football. Isn't that what I said 20 minutes ago? And you're just like, oh, I don't trust anybody. Well, now it's convenient for me to make that point. So yeah, there you go. All right. So I'm going to take the lead on pick number eight because I have a pretty good take. The Falcons, the last few years, have disregarded uh, positional weights and have gone for best player available. I think when I looked at the board and I looked at the Falcons' needs, the best player available for them was Tyler Linderbaum. And I could see them being the team, not afraid to take that risk, drafting a player like Linderbaum to be the, you know, the focal point of that offensive line for years to come. Tyler Linderbaum, pick number eight, Atlanta Falcons. All right. So I, I, I I like that. They're not going to do that, but I like that. I like that a lot because the Falcons do kind of do their own thing, right? Like even when they took AJ Terrell, no one had Terrell that high, right? Everyone's like, Oh, see lamb there yet. Bam. AJ Terrell, uh, lamb falls further than eventually going to Dallas. And yeah, the Falcons do their own thing for sure. But, uh, I mean, there's just like a, there's a siren going off above Garrett Wilson's name right here. They need a receiver. They take Garrett Wilson. It's easy, low-hanging fruit, but quality player, big position in need, and they keep it moving. It's weird when you and I agree on something, Ray. Really weird. I also have yeah. Garrett Wilson. Honestly, I think it's very possible that Jameson Williams is the better player, but I think after you just got burned by one Alabama receiver, I don't think you go and get another one. Probably stupid reasoning. Not saying that that's what I would do. I'd probably still go Jameson Williams, but I think – uh, Gary Wilson's the pick there. Okay. See, I, I think the Falcons focus on elite talent over just a good player. And I think Garrett Wilson is a good player. I think Linderbaum is an elite talent and they see that. And that's why they do that. But I, I'm not going to defend Their offensive line is pretty, pretty good. It's like, it's, it's, it's good. It's just like you have no receivers there. Uh, you think that's just addressed later on? I do. I think that's addressed later on when they decide to get a quarterback. I think this year it's going to be Mariota and Cordell Patterson just having a lot of fun, just like doing some weird stuff, having a lot of fun, doing, you know, every once in a while a pass to Kyle Pitts down the field. I I don't think they're trying to win this year. Those poor Falcons fans, dude. Sounds like tons of fun. (laughs) It'll be fun to watch. Like, Is it like a tank season? Like you're just going to go get your quarterback next year? I do. I think it makes I, sense if you if you get receivers in like in rounds two through seven, right? And then and then next year you go and, and get your quarterback because I don't think anybody expects Mariota to really be the the franchise guy. So that's why I think it's Linderbaum and not a receiver because I think when you're looking at Linderbaum, he's an elite talent that separates himself from the group. Garrett Wilson is a good player, but I think there's a lot of good receivers, some of which will be in, available in the second round where the Falcons eventually get one. So the way you're defending this, is this what you think and what you would do if you were there? No, this is what I think they okay. will actually do. Okay. This is not what yeah. I would do. Okay. Seahawks. Uh, Ray, your turn. Lead it off. All right. Your team's a mess. You have a ton of needs. And you're going to start with uh, Charles Cross. You're going to solidify that offensive line. It's a mess. It was a mess for Russ. You can't just leave it a mess. You got one good tack, one of you know one top tackle left on the board here. 
you take them, no questions asked, keep them moving. Go ahead, Bobby. Did, did you you just pick a cross? Yep. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I think it's sad to see that they waited till after Russell Wilson left to address the offensive line in this situation. Um, but I think nonetheless, if, if you think there's even a slight chance that Drew Locke could be your guy, you give him a platform to do it. You start to build a, a foundation. And if he's not your guy, okay, you have that pass protecting tackle for the next guy that comes in. Charles Cross. Yeah, Charles Cross, same thing here. I think that Andrew Luck situation is kind of ringing a bell to me. It's like once Andrew Luck retired, the Colts finally fixed the offensive line. And I feel like it's kind of going to be the same thing where like Russ left now the Seahawks are going to be like, okay, we, we can't make that same mistake twice. Let's fix the offensive line. They go cross. Like Romo too. Yeah. It's, it's apparently it's a, it's a common theme here with uh, inadequate front offices. I don't know. <laughs> All right, Bobby, you get to take the Jets last pick. Another typical Jets pick. And if this happens, monster draft for the Jets. Um, but I'd be going Derek Stingley here at 10. I think if Robert Sala comes away with Kayvon Thibodeau and Derek Stingley after Thursday night, I think there's going to be a lot of excited Jets fans that don't get any sleep. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm going Stingley if he's on the board there at 10 still. Do you know how there's, like, Super Bowl babies? Do you think because, like, the Jets don't win enough, they have, like, draft night babies? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I guess they definitely weren't draft night babies when they were drafting guys like Roger Vick in the eighties. So nine, um, nine yeah. months from now, we're going to see a lot of kids named, uh, uh, Kayvon and, and, uh, and Derek. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. A spike of that around here. Exactly. So, all right. So, so to wrap up my, what I think, right. So Jacksonville took Trevon Walker, Detroit took Hutch, Stingley to Houston, Kayvon to the Jets. Equanu to the Giants, Neal to the Panthers, Sauce to the Giants, Garrett Wilson to the Falcons, uh, Charles Cross to the to the Seahawks. So then at number 10, the Jets take Chris Olave, wide receiver there. Basically, they match him up. Uh, you know, Corey Davis, big body guy. Uh, Chris Olave, kind of the, the smooth route runner type. And then you have Elijah Moore there as your slot, you know, explosive slot yak guy. They kind of uh, complement each other, round out, you know, round each other out pretty well, and um, yeah, the, the Jets also kind of half baked this thing with one defensive and one offensive pick, but uh, at least the offensive pick fits pretty well in there. So that that rounds rounds out the what I think will happen top ten, and oh boy, is what I would do so much better than this. But we'll get into that in a few minutes. Ray, I think you gave the Jets way too much credit by taking Olave because I think they actually take Drift London because they want like the big body receiver that's going to look really good on paper, but Olave will be so much more productive. That's why I don't think the Jets take Olave, and I think they take Drake London. That rounds out my top 10. So let's just do a quick recap. Bobby, give us your top 10 in order of what you think the NFL teams will do. Okay, so I have Aiden Hutchinson to the Jags, one overall. Uh, Sauce Gardner to the Lions at two overall. Evan Neal to the Texans at three. Uh, Kayvon Thibodeau to the Jets at four, Iki Aquanu to the Giants at five, Kenny Pickett to the Panthers at six, Malik Willis to the Pittsburgh Steelers trading up to the seven pick, um, Garrett Wilson at eight to the Falcons, Charles Cross at nine to the Seahawks, and Derek Stanley to the Jets at pick number 10. Very good, Ray. All right, the Jags go with the uh, the craziness and Trevon Walker at one. Detroit still takes all the time in the world to select Hutchinson at two. Houston goes swing, uh, Stingley and swings for the fences at three. Uh, Thibodeau goes to the Jets at four. The Giants pick up Iquanu at five. The Panthers take Evan Neal at six. The Giants come back around and take Sauce Gardner at seven. The Falcons take receiver Garrett Wilson at eight. Uh, the Seahawks take Charles Cross at nine, and then the Jets round it out with Chris Olave at 10. Okay. And mine, which will actually happen, is the Jags take Aiden Hutchinson one, 
Lions take Trayvon Walker at two. Houston takes Evan Neal at three. Jets take Thibodeau at four. Giants take Iquanu at five. Panthers get their quarterback with Pickett at six. Giants at seven stay pat and take Sauce Gardner at eight. The Falcons go for uh, a generational talent in Linderbaum. At nine, the Seahawks take Charles Cross. And at 10, the Jets take uh, big receiver Drake London. All right, so that was the first half. Now we are going to do what we actually, or what we would actually do if we were the GMs of these teams, similar to like as if we were the all 22 GMs of, a, of one of our teams, right? Like how would we do it if we were running that team with all of those players that they have in place right now? So, Ray, you are going to lead this one off with pick number one. Who do you have the Jacks taking if you were the GM of the team? All right. If I'm the GM of the Jags, I look at all these teams that draft high year after year after year, right? And they do dumb stuff like draft a quarterback, right? And then turn around and then next year when they're also picking in the top 10 because they still have a bunch of holes, they go ahead and take a defensive tackle or a cornerback or some nonsense and don't invest in the environment around your quarterback that allows you to flourish, all right? You picked Trevor Lawrence a year ago. Now protect him, all right? If I'm looking at my depth chart and I have Jawan Taylor and Cam Robinson as my starting offensive tackles, there's no way I'm looking at that and going, nope, yeah, no, I'm cool. Going to go ahead and take my chances here with uh, this uh, this edge guy, Trevon Walker from uh, Georgia, and see if he can you know, hit his ceiling. No, I'm protecting my investment and my franchise guy, and I'm taking Ikeem Aquanu, number one overall offensive tackle, and I'm building – that offensive line to keep my guy upright. And uh, yeah, hopefully that allows him to be my quarterback for 15 years. So I'm not here three years from now going, well, we really, we really destroyed uh, Trevor Lawrence. So Ikeem Aquanu, number one overall, lock it in. I agreed with everything Ray said up until the very end. I don't want to waste the, the listener's time by repeating it. So I'll just say that, but I would go Evan Neal. I think Evan Neal is kind of like a can't-miss guy, right? He's a huge dude. It's funny. I watched a, a, a Sean O'Hara breakdown of Evan Neal, and he said that in high school at one point he weighed 390 pounds. And I'm like, wait, you mean 290, right? Like that's, that's what you mean? No, I looked it up, and 390 might have been a slight exaggeration, but he was up there. He was weighing like 365, 370. I'm like, oh, my God. You can't teach that kind of big. So I'm going Evan Neal. Can't miss guy, Alabama tackle, played great, um, great competition in college. I'm going Evan Neal, number one overall for the Jacksonville Jaguars for the reasons Ray just said. I love the, the way this, this round is starting because, okay, okay, I agree with everything you guys said up until both of you ended. I'm going Charles Cross. Charles Cross is the best pass protector of this group. And you talk about protecting Trevor Lawrence and Charles Cross is the guy that would do that best over Neil and over Kwanu. Charles Cross is going to be the pick. Lock it in. Pick number two, hot guys. Hot take. Hot take. That Akeem ceiling is way up there. It's way up there for Akeem, right? Yeah, Neil's big, but Akeem is strong, man. Akeem I might not even know how to block, pass block. He knows how to run he, block. He doesn't have to know how to. He still does. I could teach him. You know, I could, I could teach him the how. I think, I think either way, right, the three picks that we just made, I'd, if I'm a Jags fan, I'd be so much happier with any of these three than Trevon Walker. Pro- protect the quarterback we just got last year. Let me be excited about Trevor Lawrence. Let Doug Peterson take over that offense and do what he wants to do and, and get your guy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like, right, the quarterback's worth about almost 10% of your team, your team's performance. That's how important a quarterback is. But you don't get that value if you have a terrible offensive line. You adding an edge who might be a very uh, valuable player – does add value to your team, but adding the uh, the tackle doesn't just give you a good tackle, but it increases your quarterback ceiling, right? And I think that's the big point we're trying to stress with with that pick for all three of us, it sounds like. Absolutely. Okay. Bobby, what are you, what are you doing at number two for the Lions? Yeah, if I'm sitting in the front office in Detroit, I'm going Aiden Hutchinson after the Jacksonville Jaguars just took – Uh, Evan Neal. I think uh, in Detroit, I think Dan Campbell's trying to build a culture there. I respect it. It's blue collar. 
get a get a Michigan guy to come into Detroit and really set the pace on that Detroit defense. I think it's a I think it's a perfect match if Hutchinson is on the board at two still. Yeah, I'm I'm going Hutch. Right, he's a tone setter, position in need, valuable position. I mean, it, it checks every box. He's a Dan Campbell kind of guy. It, it just makes sense. You don't overthink it. You take Hutch there. You just need good players in that building, better players and better talent than what you've had. So just stockpile guys like Hutch and you'll be well on your way. It's that simple. Agreed. I'm going Hutch well. So I'm going to just, instead of repeating the same thing, I'm going to ask you guys, if Hutch goes number one and you are the Lions, is there any chance you decide that if you were the GM of that team, Hutch is off the board, that you go quarterback? No. No. No no shot. Honestly, I, I, I take Thibodeau. Because I think all the all the stories around Thibodeau are are BS. So if, if I'm Detroit and Hutch isn't there, I'm going Tavon. Yeah, if, he, if he's focused on all this uh, glamorized stuff outside of football, well, uh, you're in Detroit, pal. So guess what? You better start focusing on football a little more because there's not <laughs> much glamour outside of it. So uh, yeah, that that would make sense. But yeah, we I'm not, I'm not lost. taking quarterback there. Yeah, so we just many lost. followers. In Detroit. <laughs> I'm just saying, man, it's it's not L.A., you know? It's <laughs> Our two Detroit listeners just hung up, and they're never going to listen again. Yeah. No. Just saying. It's not L.A. That's all I'm saying. If Derek Oakry is listening, you can unfollow Ray, but me and Chris are cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate you. I'm sure there's tons to do there. <laughs> I say that because I care, all right? That's why I say that stuff. I say it because I care. It means something to me. Cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead off pick number three. I have the Houston Texans taking Evan Neal. Kind of the similar reasons as why we thought the Jags would. I think you build the team by building the foundation with the offensive line. I would love it if I was a rookie quarterback next year coming onto that team with Evan Neal and Laramie Tunzel being the bookend tackles. I think you just set that, that group up for success. The, the t- Texans have another pick at 12 that I could see them either adding one of the receivers or adding one of the edge talents if one of them slips. So I really think that pick is an easy choice for them. Just grab Evan Neal, build that foundation, and get the team ready for the future. Bobby, go ahead. Yes, yeah, similar to you, Chris, right? Um, I think just a different order since you took Charles Cross first. Um, and since I took Evan Neal first, I would go Iki Aquanu for Houston and for the exact same reasons you just said. If Davis Mills could be your guy, he could not be the guy. Right, if you have Icky Aquanu there, he only helps Davis Mills this year, and he only helps the guy that you might bring in next year. So I'm going Icky. All right, on the Texans, my top offensive lineman is off the board. He went to Jacksonville at one. Hutch went two, so I'm going Kayvon here at three. Again, you got to swing for the fences. You need you need some home runs. That roster is just voided of talent everywhere. So you go ahead. Get a top flight ceiling guy like Kayvon at a you know a franchise position on the defensive side, and you just just keep him moving. Okay, Ray, I'm gonna let you keep going here. What did the Jets do if you're the GM at number four? All right, I'm the Jets. So happy, right? You, you kept me from doing something stupid here, and I'm taking Evan Neal at number four. All right, perfect. Now I got my bookend offensive tackles here. My offensive line all of a sudden looks pretty darn solid here. Uh, you got Becton, Vera Tucker, McGovern. Um, you have, uh, t- uh, what is it, uh, Lincoln Tomlinson over there at the other guard spot. And now I got Evan Neal. Uh, I got my bookend tackles, a nice, solid uh, protection up front for, for my young quarterback, Zach Wilson. I'm giving him the tools that he needs to succeed and prove me right, or at least setting the stage for the next guy. But that's way down the line thinking here. But you got to, again, protect your investment that you made last year. So I'm going Evan Neal here at uh, number four to the Jets. What are you doing, Bobby? I think if I'm the Jets here at four, Neil, Hutch, and Icky are off the board. Um, at number four, I'm going Sauce Gardner. I think the Jets have a glaring need at corner. They have DJ Reed and Bryce Hall on the other side. I don't think that gets it done. Um, I think Sauce is absolutely a top five talent. He's a, another culture guy, hustle player. I think he's going to really understand what Robert Sala is trying to do over there. I'm going. Uh, I'm going. Sauce Gardner. I really, I really had a hard time with this pick. I think the Jets can do a lot of different things. Their defense obviously needs help, but I think that that team gets 
to their best. The best case happens for that team if if uh, Zach Wilson pans out, right? Like that's how they maximize the potential of the team. I struggled between tackle and receiver. While I don't think the receivers of this class are elite and some of the tackles might be, I think the offensive line is in a really good place. Adding a tackle, yes, it maybe takes it to the next level, but with just Corey Davis and Elijah Moore, I'm taking Garrett Wilson at number four for the Jets because I think it maximizes the potential of this offense. A little bit of a hot take. You wouldn't trade that's back that's and grab him? You'd stay there and grab him? I don't think anybody any... trading up for anybody here. Yeah, no one's yeah. trading up for anybody here. <laughs> Actually, Adam Schefter said today that there's more teams that are looking to trade back than there are teams looking to trade forward. And it, and, and it makes sense. You look at the, the talent pool in this draft, it makes a lot of sense. Exactly. And that's why I didn't have it happening. Uh, and I'll actually, I have some, some exciting takes on that later on. Okay, Bobby, I saved the New York Giants at pick number five for you. If you were the GM of the Giants, what are you doing at that pick? Yeah, pick number five, Neil and Icky are off the board. I'm going cross. I'm not messing around. I think the position group has been pretty bad, and it's been pretty clear they've been pretty bad. I, I want to give Daniel Jones the best chance to succeed, although I think that Carolina is probably looking quarterback at number six. You really never know, especially after McAdoo did say that Sam Donald could be their guy going into this year, and they do also have a need at tackle. I'm not chancing the fact that Cross could be there possibly for me at seven. Sounds like the Giants like him enough to take him at five, take him at five, get your pass protector, give Daniel Jones a chance to succeed. Yeah, I I, I took uh, Cross at five if I'm the Giants. No messing around. You got uh, – uh, Matt Parrott coming off of an injury there. You have Andrew Thomas at the, on the left side, but really nothing else anywhere else on that line there. So uh, go ahead, take take Cross, solidify that other tackle spot there. Um, stop playing games and, uh, yeah, keep it moving. I can't let Ray just gloss over Mark Lewinsky, okay? And I, I, also... li- I like Lewinsky. He's, he's fine. He's fine. He's a fine player. I like him. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. And Parrott, even good. before he was hurt, just played like he was hurt. He just wasn't good. <laughs> right. Hopefully he takes that year three jump. I think this is going to be year three for Pert. If I am the Giants, I am going to the Jets GM and I'm I'm giving him like a bear hug because I'm so happy that he went receiver in my mock at four and saved me from being without any of the top three tackles. Akim Kwanu is still there for me and I'm running that up and I'm taking him and I'm going to start reconstructing that offensive line. Now you have Andrew Thomas and Akim Kwanu and you and you got to be excited about that. So, five, Iki Mukwanu for the New York Giants. I'll start off with pick number six, the Carolina Panthers select quarterback Malik Willis. That was another one that was pretty tough for me uh, because the top tackles were off the board. I think that is the biggest need for the Panthers is to build that offensive line. I don't think there's a player there that adds the value to that team uh, in, in any way other than really trying to get a quarterback that you can land and and fix that team uh, and just pray for the best. And if, if it doesn't work out, honestly, I'm probably trying to do it again next year. But uh, I would definitely take a flyer on the leak, give him a shot to prove himself. So that's my pick at six. Ray, who do you have? All right, Carolina. We're going to do the same thing we did last year, except this time it's the right move. All right. One year ago, we passed up on a quarterback and took a corner. We're going to do it again here with Derek Stingley. All right. He's a perfect compliment to JC Horn. JC Horn's that nice, big, physical press guy. Stingley, again, assuming the foot checks out and everything, super athletic and run with anybody. Um, you know, great ball skills, just really just showed everything you want to see, uh, you know, early that freshman year. I think that guy's still in him. So I'm going ahead. I'm not reaching here and I'm taking Derek Stingley. Um, best player on the board. And sometimes it's just as simple as, hey, who's the best player on the board? It's Stingley. All right, take him. All right, nice pick. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were also going to say quarterback, honestly. (laughs) Um, Goodness, no. I'm actually agreeing with Chris. If I'm them, I go Malik Willis. Um, In my mock of what I think they would do, I think they would go Kenny Pickett because of the ties to Matt Rule. But honestly, after seeing Pickett 
and Willis over the past few months. I say F the ties to <laughs> to Kenny Pickett, and I think you go with the better player, which is Malik Willis. And I still think Malik Willis fits into what Matt Rule and Ben McAdoo are trying to do. I think I just think he's better at it. I saw some highlights of Malik where he, you know, the, the pocket collapses and he has to do some creative things to get, you know, get away and make a make a throw down the field. I feel like we're going to see a lot of that in Carolina, but it's still the best case scenario for them, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Ray, you get to take the Giants' second pick, leading it off. What are you doing at seven? All right. So I'm going to recap here, right? The Jags took Iquanu. The Lions took Hutchinson. The Texans took Kayvon. Jets took Evan Neal. Uh, Giants took Cross. And the Panthers took Stingley. So here I am on the clock. As the Giants, I got two phones here, right? And I've been on the phone with two teams. One of them was the Washington Commanders. And the reason I was on the phone with the Washington Commanders is because, oh, you know, this whole like trade within your division thing, like I'm not scared of facing any of these quarterbacks in this class twice a year. So I have no problem making a trade with the Commanders. But on my other phone, the Saints called me and they got two first round picks in this class. So I'm going ahead and trading back to with the New Orleans Saints so they move up and they want to go ahead and, you know, roll the dice and gamble. They, you know, go ahead, go for it. So I'm the Giants. I'm trading back into the back half of the first year, picking up both the New Orleans first. And the Saints are going to go ahead and take uh, Willis here at uh, seven overall. And now with my two picks as the Giants, I can go ahead and say, now I can go ahead and uh, take care of the interior of my offensive line. I hate that. Why, why? I hate it why do you hate it? Why do you hate it? No, I, I hate I hate the idea of trading back from seven if you're not going to get a first next year, and the Saints don't have that. So there's no there's no way I'm doing that because this is this is what we want to do, right, Ray? So if I'm if I'm the GM of the Giants and I get a call from the from the Saints, I'm sorry, it's just it's just not happening. Although they, they got two this year. What's that? They got two this year. You, you, you got Understood. two more picks to make. Understood. But Daniel Jones probably not getting that fifth year option. Um, if I need a quarterback next year, I want to make sure I have the ammo to go and get him. That's the only way I get that trade done, and that's why in my mock, what I would do is what I also think the Giants will do, which is trading with Pittsburgh so that Pittsburgh can come up and get Kenny Pickett. Stay, Kenny Pickett stays in Pittsburgh, athletic guy, just like just like what Mike Tomlin's looking for. He's the second best off the board behind Willis. So I have those guys flipped around in what I would want to do. Um, and well, I have the Giants. The Steelers, the Steelers didn't call me, all right? They didn't call me, all right? I got two phones here. They didn't, pay, they didn't call either one of them. Oh, they'll so be calling. I had to go ahead and make the trade oh, with, the, with the Saints. And I'm, and I'm looking, I'm like, oh, man, look at, look at Kenyon Green over there in the back half of the first. Oh, ooh, look at Tyler <laughs> Linderbaum over there. I like that. Look at that offensive line I could put together. And I'm going, sorry, Pittsburgh, you didn't call me. So. I made the move that was available to me. That's it. Trade back for the Giants. You get Linderbaum. You get a corner like the guys I talked about before. Or you draft a linebacker in the first round for the first time since Carl Banks. I'm okay with that too. Ooh, that, you should have done that last year if, if you wanted a linebacker. You should have done that last year. So. At 20, it makes sense. At 20, it makes sense. Coming out with three offensive linemen in this class. And no, I know you're talking like about baby. Yeah, you're talking about Parsons too. So yeah. <laughs> See, I think you guys both took took some liberties here. Because I'm gonna ask you both a question and I want an honest answer. If you're the Saints or you're the Steelers and you're the GM of those teams, do you make the moves that you had them making? Saints, no, because I don't think I think I think Jameis is good enough to get you by this year or ne- or the next couple of years, right? If I'm the Steelers, absolutely, absolutely, because I think I think Kenny Pickett can come in and compete with Trubisky. Um, if it's not week one, but you know, sometime around week five, whatever it is, after the bye week, and come in and be that starter. I I wouldn't because I if I'm the Steelers, I would not just because I hate the quarterbacks in this class. If I'm their GM, right? So if I'm the and if I'm the GM of the Saints, no, I also wouldn't do it, but. I'm also not the GM of the Saints because I wouldn't have made that trade in the first place. And I feel like the only reason they made that trade was to continue to move up in this this year's draft to get their quarterback. I feel like, like we talked about in that previous episode, 
I think it was a prelude to the the second move up they're going to do on draft night to get a QB, and I think this is the spot for it. So, uh, again, in this world, I'm only doing the top ten. I'm the Giants GM right now. So, but uh, yeah, if I'm the Saints, I'm not doing it. But that's also because I would not have done the initial trade with the Eagles to even be in that position to do it in the first place. Yeah. See, I think I think that's so. Ray just admitted to lying. He did it in a you know, or not lying, but cheating. Bobby, you know, Bobby said that he would have actually done it. But see, like I, I look at both of those teams, the Saints and Pittsburgh, and I look at both of their offensive lines, and they've both gotten worse. Steelers need offensive line pieces, in my opinion, before they make a move like this to get a quarterback. And I'll have a hot take on that uh, a little bit later. The Saints, their offensive line got worse. They lost Taron Armstead. Michael Thomas is really their only receiver that a quarterback would have to throw to. So I don't really love that situation for a rookie quarterback. And that's why if I am the Giants, those guys aren't calling me because they don't I would be the GM of those teams and they don't want to call up um, and they actually stay there and try to maximize their potential. And they draft Tyler Litterbaum. And the reason they do that is because again, nothing else matters to this team than making sure that that offense is successful. And that starts with the offensive line, something they haven't had in years. If they get Akeem Aquanu and Tyler Linderbaum to go with uh, Andrew Thomas on that offensive line, you can honestly look your fans in the eye and say, I've done everything in my power to make this, this offense better. Uh, you give Daniel, Ch- Daniel Jones every single chance to be successful, um, Saquon to be successful, Kenny Galladay to be successful. I think that's how you do it. So I'm staying and I'm drafting Tyler Linderbaum. I, I, I just took Linderbaum at like 16 after making my trade. So those, like, those teams so aren't all in Ray. Oh my gosh. No, they're not calling you that. That's why you have to stay and pick because nobody wants to trade with you, Chris. So that's why you have to stay there and make the pick. But Generational he, talent, Ray. You don't mess around. Take him. Listen, he's, he's, he's got very good tape. He's my interior offensive lineman number two in this year's class. All right. So there's so, that. So, Bobby, you go ahead and you uh, let us know what the Falcons are doing. You're doing for the Falcons at eight. So with the Falcons at eight, Kayvon Thibodeau is still on the board because of some crazy drafting ahead, and I don't I don't give it much thought. I sprint up the card for Kayvon Thibodeau. I think you missed on Tack McKinley a few years back. Um, it's a position that they kind of haven't gotten right. They have Lorenzo Carter there, but I, I watched Lorenzo Carter for his his tenure with the Giants. He's not he's not going to be your your uh, he's not going to be that marquee edge rusher that you want. Um, Thibodeau's there. I'm sprinting that card up. Easy for uh, easy for me here. Go ahead, take Garrett Wilson. So much what I think they will do. I think they will do what I would do, which is, again, you got a glaring need at receiver. Best one's still there for you, so you go ahead and take him. You take Garrett Wilson, and, uh, yeah, keep him moving. Yeah, in my situation, the Falcons couldn't be more happy. But it was still there for them in my draft as well, and they run the card up, and they take him, and they just make that team a little bit better. Uh, okay, I'm going to pick. Uh, hold, first. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, we got to back up. So both of you guys allowed Kayvon to fall all the way to eight. Yeah. Oof. There's a lot of teams ahead of them with young quarterbacks that have a desperate need to make those situations better. And I think that has to be their priority. Otherwise, absolutely. T- Thibodeau should have been the guy that went. Um, but to me, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's, by drafting him, you're maximizing the value of your team. Quarterbacks mess everything up, man. That's 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 the only reason why he's still there. Pure yes. pure talent, he wouldn't be there. Okay, so pick number nine, Seahawks. I did a little bit, like I kind of just saw some some stuff that looked familiar. I took Sauce Gardner here. He's like that long, rangy corner that they they tend to draft. And I think that's a really good situation. In this case, none of the tackles were available to them. Uh, so they go corner Sauce Gardner. Bobby, go ahead. Yeah, so similar to what you're saying, um, there's no tackle here for for Seattle. Although I want one for them if I'm if I'm Seattle right here at nine, um, but I'm not going to reach on a guy like Trevor Penning or uh, Bernard Raymond. I just don't see that being worth pick number nine. Same with the quarterbacks. I mean, the ones I took at six and seven for Carolina and Pittsburgh. It's probably generous for them. So I'm going best player available or most valuable need, um, which is Jermaine Johnson, the edge rusher. Um, 
I think there's been some talk about him going top five or being a top five talent. I think there's something to that. I could see him going here at nine, or I would take him here at nine if I'm Seattle. Oof. You were you were close. You were close, Bobby. Taking Trevon Walker here if I'm the Seahawks. Similar reasons, but uh, he's he's higher on the board for me um, than than Jermaine Johnson. Similar concerns overall, but I, I got uh, Trevon a little higher there. Massive needs on that side of the ball, on both sides of the ball, really. Uh, so I'm going ahead and taking Trevon Walker here at nine. I wasn't sure. It was between Trevon Walker and Jermaine Johnson. I don't think either of those are bad picks, but Ray lead it off for the Jets with pick number 10 to round out uh, this round. All right, Jets, Jets, it's easy for me, right? So again, I am back on the clock here at number four overall. I took Evan Neal. So I'm going to go ahead and continue to help out my young quarterback and take Chris Olave. Like I mentioned earlier, his skill set just fits so nicely with the other two guys they've got with Corey Davis as the big body guy and Elijah Moore as the uh, slippery slot yak guy. Um, Olave can do his thing as a route runner there. So really nice complimentary pieces. I made my offensive line stronger. I made my receivers stronger. And now it's up to uh, Zach Wilson to go ahead and, and keep improving and grow up. So I feel good knowing I really leaned into the offensive side here if I'm the Jets taking both the Neal at four and then Olave at 10. You, you had them taking Olave in the other mock, right? Yep. Yeah, so, I think I think they uh, I think they screw it up this year, but that's because they go defense at four as opposed to two offensive picks. But yes, that ten I had them going Olave as what I think they would do. Also, got it. All right, Bobby, what are you doing? What I want to do if I'm the Jets is lean the exact opposite way because of the way the cards fell. Not that I disagree that they shouldn't be investing in their offense around Zach Wilson. Just the the value that's there in mine is Derek Stingley at 10. Um, I think if he's there, you sprint that car to the podium, you take Stingley, I think it helps your quarterback. Also, if you keep getting him the ball. So I'm going Stingley. I'm going Stingley as well. The None of the offensive linemen fell. Uh, we went receiver at four to help out Zach Wilson. I don't think there's another offensive piece at that point that's as valuable as adding a top corner in Stingley. So they stay and they grab Stingley. Cool. All right, guys. So quickly, we are going to talk about just wild predictions for the upcoming draft. Who wants to, t- we'll go like, we'll do like round Robin. Who wants to go first? I'll go. Mine's not that wild. I think if, if there's an over under of three and a half quarterbacks that go in the first round, I think they, I think I'd go under and say that there's going to be three quarterbacks. I think a team's going to come back up into the first round at picks 30 to 32 and come get a quarterback to get them on that, that extra year that you get from drafting a quarterback in the first. So while I only have Pickett and Willis going in the the top 10 picks, I think I only have one more quarterback going in the rest of the draft. And I think he comes in at the end as a result of a trade of somebody coming back in. Who is it? I don't know. I could see it being Sam Howell. It, it depends on the team that, that, that comes up and, that comes up and gets him. If it's if it's who I want, I'm saying Desmond Ritter, who I think would probably be Sam Howell. All right, Ray, your turn. That's that's pretty wild. I mean, does does my scenario of the Saints trading up for Willis is that wild? I, I think that's I think I think either the Saints or the Steelers, kinda like that scenario I was bouncing back and forth, is gonna happen. Um I'm not sure it'll be with the Giants, although if I was the Giants, I would be trying to make that happen at seven. Um, I could see a trade up there. I think there's going to be a bit of a bidding war, perhaps when Washington is on the clock just outside of the top 10 there for some of those teams in the back half of the first to make that move up and get their quarterback. Um, so I think it's either going to be the Saints or the Steelers who make a big deal with the commanders to get a QB. So I went way more wild than you guys. So mine's like very wild. I have the Giants trading with the Saints moving back at from five, though. They trade from five, and the Saints grab Pickett. And when they do that, the Giants then move back. At seven, they take Icky. And then at the end of the first round, they take Tyler Linderbaum and Zion Johnson. And they go with three offensive linemen, and the Saints get the quarterback nobody thought that they wanted to get anyway. And it's a little more wild. It's just a little more wild. 
I would love to be offensive lineman. <laughs> that's Shoot, why I'll I did what five. I did. That's why I did what I did. <laughs> that's why. I, that's why I traded back from seven. <laughs> All that, right. that, that's my that's my metaverse right there. That's that's my metaverse playing out. I get it. From seven I get now. it. I just if if I'm trading back, I want the like I said, want that first round in the uh, 2023 NFL draft. Okay, so what's your next move? What's your next wild prediction for the draft? My, mine really aren't wild that wild compared to yours already. <laughs> I, I think I think I think the Saints. I think the Saints stay put with their two picks. I think that's kind of crazy because everybody assumes that. They got them to make another move. And now I'm starting to think the way the board, you know, might play out. Um, I think they stay put. I, I got one for you. I wonder it may happen. Here's one that, that may happen that I don't know if you consider it terribly wild, but I think the teams picking in the back of the first round, for the most part, are picking there because they're smart. They know what they're doing. All right. They're well-run organizations. So if Jerry Jones doesn't go full Jerry Jones, it wouldn't shock me if Traylon Burks falls out of the first round because he's a very incomplete player. There's some there's some pretty big red flags there. I mean, when's the last time you've heard of a receiver who needs to control his weight actually being successful in this league? It didn't last more than one year for Kelvin Benjamin. I think that's a huge red flag. And I think the teams that need receiver – late in the first, like the Chiefs and the Packers and so forth, they're eyeing guys that are more in the Sky Moore, Jahan Dotson type mold than they are a big guy who, who you know, we're not sure can run routes. Um, so if Jerry Jones doesn't do some dumb stuff on draft night, it wouldn't shock me if Traylon Burks falls out of the first round. And if he does fall out of the first round, that means these guys know what they're doing. Yeah, I kind of think that's going to happen. I don't know how wild that is. But not a very wild guy. I don't know what you want me to say. Like, I wanted you guys to think of yourselves as like a kid in a candy shop. Like, you can do whatever creative, crazy thing you can do. That's why I have the Packers taking two receivers and the Chiefs taking zero. So that's what my next wild take is the Packers take George Pickens and uh, Dotson from Penn State. The Chiefs, because the Packers do that, none of the guys they wanted are there anymore. And they go, uh, they go both both picks on the defensive side, so they don't go a single receiver in the first round to replace Tyree Kill. Chris, you'd love stirring the pot, man. And and you can't blame me and Ray for not really like going crazy after we predicted like how many trades did we predict for last year's draft, and then like none of them happened. I had the Vikings trading up for Fields in last year's class, and it didn't happen. Yeah, so COVID, I'm, I'm going to try to be wild. COVID draft too. We thought it was like no brainer. This draft was going to be crazy, and it it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. All right. Well, I have only one more. If you guys are done, I'll just do my last one. Is that the Steelers stay at twenty and they get Malik Willis, and it has nothing to do with what I think about Willis. I just think teams are not going to overpay for quarterbacks this year, and I think the Steelers get their guy at twenty. So that's my last bold prediction for this draft. Interesting. Cool. Cool. You'd be smart. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed uh, doing that with us. If you haven't done so yet, definitely go check out on our Twitter page. We're doing a little bit of like a promo. If you were able to correctly guess some of the top 10 picks, um, you know, we're going to do whoever predicts the most. We have a point system lined up. You'll win a free subscription to all 22 for the year. Um, so definitely get in there and check it out. Um, and if you haven't done so yet, go to all-22.com to sign up for our uh, landing page to find out more about our game. Uh, we will be releasing very soon, so there will be a lot more to come. Anything else, guys? However you're uh, listening to us or watching, you know, feel free to give us a like or a five-star rating, subscribe, follow, however it is that you listen or watch us. We appreciate you, and we'll catch you pretty soon. Thank you. Salute. Happy draft week. Yeah.